Fiasco is a tabletop role-playing game that puts three to five players into the shoes of the characters of a theoretical Coen Brothers film. It's all about high ambition and low impulse control, designed to be played in a single sitting with no game master. A second edition was released on Kickstarter in 2020, in which Bully Pulpit Games endeavored to streamline the process by replacing dice with cards, reduce the need to bring in outside components, and make the game move just a little faster. But today, we're talking about Fiasco Classic. If you purchase this game, all you'll get is this rulebook, which details the system we're about to go over, along with four playsets to get you started. When you feel comfortable exploring other options, FiascoPlaysets.com has almost 500 of them available for free, a healthy mix between official releases by Bully Pulpit over the years and fan-made creations. And if that's not enough, the separately released Fiasco Companion book has a section dedicated to creating playsets of your own from scratch. The first step in playing a game of Fiasco is to choose a playset. Next, you'll need to provide a few additional components for each player. A pencil, two index cards, sticky notes, or small pieces of paper, another sheet of paper to be folded and used as a nameplate, and two dice each in two different colors. One will come to represent positive outcomes throughout the course of the game, the other negative. When you have everything you need, roll all the dice in the middle of the table and sort them by result. The colors won't matter until later. You'll use these dice and the playset tables you've selected to build the world your story takes place in. Starting with the player who grew up in the smallest town and going clockwise, you'll spend one die to establish a relationship category between the character you'll be role-playing and that of one of your neighboring players. Once a relationship category has been established for two characters, either player can choose to spend a die to further define that relationship with a detail. Once a relationship between two characters has been fully defined, you can start spending dice to attach needs, objects, or locations to the relationship in the same process. The first die establishes the category, the second further defines a slightly more specific detail. Take turns going around the table, spending one die at a time until all the dice have been spent. And note that while your selections from the tables are limited to what dice remain throughout most of this process, the very last die is wild. Whoever spends that one can use it for whatever they want. When you finish, every character should have a clearly defined relationship with two others. And it's a good idea to have at least one need, one location, and one object somewhere in the mix. Finally, come up with a name for your character and write it on your nameplate. Throughout this whole process, remember, this is a collaborative effort to tell the most interesting story you can. It's not about who wins and who loses. In a game of fiasco, any character winning at much of anything for very long is kind of unusual. It's all about telling a tale full of high ambitions and low impulse control. So keep that in mind as you go through the setup process. And don't be afraid to ask your friends for help if you're not quite sure how you want to spend your dice. Also, don't get too attached to any ideas too early. All the characters should be pretty nebulous until you start to see their relationships with each other taking shape. And as you attach needs, objects, and locations to those relationships, work together with your friends to make sure the choices you're making fit within the framework of the story that you think might be about to happen here. When setup is complete, you're ready to start the game. It plays out over two acts comprised of two scenes featuring each character. Choose someone to put the spotlight on for the first scene, probably someone who has a little experience with role-playing games. They'll choose to either establish the scene or resolve it. If you choose to establish, you'll put yourself, the player, in the director's chair, choosing what other characters are in the scene with your character, where it takes place, when, because it could be a flashback, concurrent with other scenes that have already been played out or sometime after, and whether any objects or needs are involved. If you choose to resolve, the rest of the players at the table will collectively establish the scene for you. Your character should be the focal point of the scene, 
but you can incorporate any other characters at the table too, or even some non-player characters, tapping anyone at the table to fill in those gaps. Once a scene has been established, call action and start role-playing. At some point throughout the course of the scene, whoever didn't establish, either the current player or the rest of the group, will resolve an outcome. The scene will either end favorably for this character or not. Take the die of the corresponding color from the pile in the center of the table once you think you know how the scene's going to end. And once it's reached a conclusion that fits that die, the active player calls cut. In Act 1, the player whose character was the star of that scene will then choose another character at the table to give that die to. Then the next clockwise player will star in a scene of their own, and so on and so forth, until half of the dice have been used to resolve. Then comes the tilt. Everyone at the table rolls the dice they've collected throughout the first act. Add up the sum of each color of dice you rolled and subtract the lower total from the higher. From there, whoever has the highest total in each color will be in charge of selecting the tilt. Roll all the unused dice to get some random numbers, then refer to the tilt table on pages 56 and 57 of the book. Each of the two players determining the tilt will, with the input of the other players, spend one of those dice in the center of the table on a category. Then they'll spend a second die to define a detail on the other player's category. These new twists must be incorporated into the story at some point between now and the end of the game. Act 2 plays out much the same as Act 1, taking turns acting out scenes where your character is the focal point. But now, you keep those two new tilt elements in mind. Act 2 also changes things up by keeping resolved dice in front of the star character of that scene, instead of forcing them to give them away. Again, the final die is wild. Regardless of its color, the last player to resolve a scene chooses whether it has a positive or negative outcome. Once all the dice have been resolved, everyone will roll all their dice, subtract the lower color's total from the higher, and refer to the aftermath tables on pages 58 and 59 to see how things ultimately end for their character. Then, go around the table playing out the epilogue of your story in montage form, spending a die for each vignette starring your character. And for an added creative twist, make sure each vignette adheres to the positive or negative connotation of that die's color. At the end of it all, there may be tragedy, destruction, and very rarely will there be a clear winner. But hopefully you'll all have a good time, even if your characters don't. And that's what really matters in the end, isn't it? That's how you play Fiasco Classic. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like that, be sure to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and most importantly, go on over to twitch.tv slash BNB Tabletop and give us a follow there. We play board games live every Sunday night at 7.30 p.m. Pacific time on a show we call The Board and Barrel. And it's a very interactive broadcast. We have house rules that you guys can influence throughout the course of the game. Virtual bingo. You can bet on who's going to win. It's a lot of fun. And I look forward to seeing you there.